Well, good morning, church. How are you this morning? Come on, we can do better than that. Are you good? Are you here? Do you have a pulse? Are you breathing? Come on, we are a thankful people and we've got a lot to be thankful for. I want to welcome everyone who's watching online. Also want to welcome our Middletown campus. Hey, Middletown, how are you this morning? So I've got a couple things that I want to get into and then we're going to get into God's Word this morning, kicking off a new series, Inconvenient Truths. Oh, this is going to be fun. Um, first one is this. We have Connect class happening today. Now, uh, maybe you come from another church or maybe traditional church and, and you have gone through maybe like a membership class before. I think that's great, um, but you can be a member to Southwest Airlines. So we wanted to change up the verbiage a little bit and revamp the class and the curriculum because <laughs> we want you to have an ability to connect. So this is happening at our Middletown campus and at our Bear campus. So after service, even if you didn't sign up, we always make room. We talk about there being room at the table. We talk about there's always another seat. We'll make space. We'll make room. And so if that's you this morning, even if you've been going to the church for a while, but you're like, I've never gone through the process. Let's go through the process together. It's going to be fun. And we've got some, I'm just telling you, there's, there's some, some people uh, and some ladies who can cook. And so if you smell something good coming in, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that's just, that's the blessing of the Lord right there. So make sure you partake. There's a space for you. So that'll be right after service, both campuses. Also, I want you to go ahead and get your smartphone out. This is not the time to check texts. Do not doom scroll right now. But I want you to get your calendar function out because I want to encourage you a couple times a year, we will have nights of worship. Have you ever been in church before and you're like, man, I just wish... We could have just kept on worshiping. Well, this is your shot. Like, night of worship. So June 23rd, 6 p.m., but there's a twist. It's actually going to be at the Middletown campus. And this is the first time we're ever doing a night of worship at the Middletown campus. So it's always fun to be a part of a first. So make sure you are present. It's going to be a wonderful time. So... Have you ever read scripture before and uh, maybe struggled a little bit with something you read? Maybe it challenged you. Have you ever come across a scripture? You're like, mm, I wish that one wasn't in there. Or like you're reading with your finger duh, 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 and you're like, mm, we're going to go down a couple paragraphs and then we can keep going. I think we all have because there's some things in scripture that they're tough. They're difficult. They're, did I read that correctly? And yet there are things that challenge us so we can grow. There are things that Jesus said that aren't all roses and daffodils. You know, he said things like, in this world, there will be trouble. And sometimes we think we can exempt out you know, uh, you know, I've been, I've been a really good believer, Lord. You should see my church attendance. It's like once every six weeks. And uh, so I, I think I can exempt from this test, and yet nobody gets to exempt from the trials in life. I like to call it Dalmatian theology. Dalmatian theology is I like that spot and that spot and that spot, but the rest of that I'm not interested in. Well, guess what? We don't get to do it that way. Because there is a faith that's pure, a faith that's grown through fire. And sometimes it's the trials that produce the growth and the fortification in us. Now, James 4.17 says, If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it's sin to them. Pastor, I need a more peppier verse than that. Like, like I, I, need the, I need the Jeremiah 29, verse 11. No, no, we're going to stay here for just a second. Do you understand that based off of the revelation that you're aware of, the truth that you're aware of, you're held accountable for that truth. So if you know the right thing to do, you're accountable for what you know. So we're in this series called Inconvenient Truths, and we're talking about things that we kind of wish that Jesus didn't say. 
because it's difficult or it's challenging or it's something that we have to wrestle with or it's something that's calling us to change. I don't want to change. I like things the way they are. I don't like to be moved. I'm, I'm, I'm X, Y years old and this is the way it's always been, so we need to keep it this way. Wait, Jesus still calls us to change, to grow, to become, to become conformed to the image of his son, Christ. Because it's the things that challenge us that can also be the things that God uses to transform us. So we have to learn to embrace the challenge so God can do the deeper work, so that God can bring about the transformation or if you want the fancy theological word, the sanctification, the becoming more like Jesus in us so that he can use us for the world and for humanity and for our families. So let's open our Bibles to Luke chapter 10 and verse 25. Luke chapter 10 and verse 25. And we're going to pick up on a story between Jesus and a leader in religious law. So verse 25 says, One day an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus. His motives weren't necessarily pure. He was, he was coming to test Jesus by asking him this question, Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, what does the law of Moses say you should do? How do you interpret that? How do you read that? And the man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, all your strength, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Right, Jesus told him, do this and you will live. And the man wanted to justify his actions. I, I would like to say it like this. The, the, the man, there, there were some neighbors that he really didn't want to love. He was a lawyer looking for a loophole. He was trying to find a way to get out of this because I've got to love God with everything, like the hidden things, like the closet things, like the things that I don't want anybody else to see. I've got to love God with all of it. And then I've got to love my neighbor the same way I love myself. Well, I love myself with pedicures. So I'm supposed to love my neighbor to that degree. That's what the word says. And so he's looking for this loophole. He's trying to justify his actions, his beliefs, his behaviors. And he says, and who is my neighbor? Who is the one that I need to be good to and love them the way I love myself? And Jesus, in verse 30, replied with a story. He said, a Jewish man was traveling on a trip from Jerusalem to Jericho. And he was attacked by bandits and they stripped him of his clothes. They beat him up and left him half dead beside the road. Verse 31, by chance a priest came along, but when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and he passed him by. And then a temple assistant or a Levi walked over and looked at him and saw him lying there. He took inventory. He stared at him, but he also passed to the other side of the road. And then in verse 33, Jesus takes it to another level. He says, then a despised Samaritan came along. And when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. He felt something going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and with wine. And then he bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey. He walked. Well, this man who has been hurt is riding on his donkey. And he took him to an inn where he could take care of him. Then the next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, take care of this man. And if the bill runs higher than what I just paid you, then this, 
I'll pay you next time I'm here. I'm going to come back and check, and I'll pay you next time. And then Jesus says to the lawyer, but he really says to all of the audience, now which of these three would you say was the neighbor of the man who was attacked by bandits? And in verse 37, the man, the lawyer replied, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said, yes, now go and do the same. Many literary uh, critics and not just Christian ones, not just Christian commentators, but literary critics revere this as possibly the greatest story that has ever been told because of the message that it implies. And, the, and, and it's all built around this question, this trick question that the lawyer asks, what should I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus flips it on him. Have you ever had somebody, you ask them a question and then they answer your question with a question and then you forget the question you asked to begin with? And so here is Jesus and he flips it on him and he asks him a question. And he asks, what does the law require? And the lawyer actually gets it right. He quotes what we know as the great commandment. There's, there was a lot of commandments, but if you boil it down, this is the greatest of all commandments. Love God with everything you got and love others the way you love yourself. If you want to boil down the gospel, Christianity, whatever you want to call it, if you boil it down to the most simple state, that's it. Love God with all you got and love others the way you love you. That's significant. That's a real love. And then he asks, well, you know, who's my neighbor? Because I, I know who lives to the house on the right and the left of me. I know who's down my street. But who is my neighbor? Because there's some certain people I don't really want to like. And they discuss the requirements of the law but now Jesus is getting ready to reveal grace. This lawyer was talking about just the law, but Jesus says, no, 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 I'm going to take it to another level. I'm going to reveal the message of grace because I am the message of grace. Now imagine Jesus has a crowd that he's speaking to. He's got his disciples there. He's got this lawyer there and they're all listening intently. And he begins to talk about a road that they would have known. Jerusalem to Jericho. Cities that would have been known by those people at that time. And so they could visualize it in their mind's eye. Maybe you can visualize 95 or Route 1. You can, you can see it in your mind's eye and you know exactly the mile markers. You know what it looks like. And this audience could do the same. So the story gets real and there's a, a man who gets jumped and he gets beaten and he's stripped and he's left for dead. Imagine he's laying beside the road and one eye opens and he sees a priest walking towards him. And everybody in that crowd is thinking, oh, this is fantastic. This religious person is going to take care of him. Except the priest sees him from a distance and doesn't just walk by him, but adds injury to insult, goes to the other side of the road to get away from him and to distance himself from him. And then continues walking like there's nothing to see here. Imagine the rejection. Imagine the pain for that man who can't care or take care of himself. And he's watching the, a person who should do him good and should help him out just continue to walk by. But then there's a Levite, a, a, a priest's assistant Maybe the associate pastor is going to help me. He's, he's walking by and he sees him. And, and the, the associate pastor actually walks up to him, 
takes inventory of him, this Levite does, but then he does the same thing and walks to the other side of the road and continues on. Oh, the pain, he was so close to me. He, he saw me, he knew the condition that I was in, and yet he kept on walking. The two people who would have been most apt to help just walked on by. I think Jesus was actually symbolizing a picture of the law through these actions because you've got to remember the Old Testament law was all about quotas and requirements. And that's the danger of religion. It can become nothing more than quotas and requirements. I've just got to check the box. I've just got to work on my church attendance. I did my quiet time and I read a couple verses. I'm good. And it becomes mechanical and it loses the life. And so these men who should have been there to help kept on walking because it wasn't Benevolence Day on their calendar. It was too inconvenient for them. How many times has unpure religion left people worse off than they were before? If you've been saved more than like 15 minutes, you've probably had some church hurt before. There's no one who's immune from it. There's no one who's exempt from it, self included. And that's the danger of religion. It can make your heart calloused. But that's working in reverse because what God wants to do, he said through Ezekiel that he wants to take our heart of stone and turn it into a heart of flesh, a heart of compassion, a heart of empathy, a heart of love, a heart that beats for God and for others. And so religion represents a callousness. And if you're in here this morning and you've experienced legitimate church hurt, I'm sorry. But the truth is, because the church is the people, and <laughs> until Jesus returns, people are always going to make mistakes. People are always going to mess it up. They're not going to get it right. So sometimes you have to love somebody despite them. They, they might have been intentionally mean, and I'm so sorry for that. But that's not necessarily a reflection of your God. That's not a reflection of who Jesus is or the ministry that he wants to do in your life. So don't confuse religion with this amazing relationship that Jesus wants to have with you. So Jesus is painting a picture and then the plot thickens and there's a third traveler who enters the scene. And just like the priests, I'm gonna go back for just a second. Let's, I can't get away from church hurt for some reason. So here's what I wanna say. This is an imperfect institution because the church is not even the building. The Greek word for church is ekklesia and it literally means a gathering of people. So because we are all people who are dependent on grace ourselves, we're not always going to do it right. But that doesn't mean you throw the baby out with the bathwater. That doesn't mean just because you were hurt one time, I'm never going back and you make an inner vow. Nobody's going to hurt me like that again. Nobody's going to hold that authority over me again. They're not going to do that to me again. No, 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 no. Part of healing is walking vulnerably even when it's scary. And sometimes you got to walk in the valley of the shadow of death and familiarity into scary places and trust that, you know what, maybe God is going to use this leader or maybe God is going to show up in this place and maybe I shouldn't be skipping out on church attendance because I'm scared it's going to happen again. The truth is it may happen again. 
One of the things I've, we've learned over the years is when people work really close to us, we say, hey, I want to tell you something. At some point in our relationship, I'm going to hurt your feelings, step on your toes, not see you, do something that hurts you. I hope that it's unintentional, but it might be intentional. And I want you to please, please forgive me ahead of time. So when that moment comes, you'll remember this conversation and go, oh, yeah. He's made out of clay too. And the truth is, <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me say it a little crude. Forgive me. Forgive me, Middletown. But all of our stuff stinks because we are marred clay, but we are trying to become like Jesus. There was only one perfect, and we're trying to become like him. So give your brothers and sisters grace in the meantime. Okay, I got that out of my system. Let's talk about the Samaritan who rolls up on the scene and the priests are representing the law, but Jesus uses the Samaritan to represent grace. And it says that it wasn't just a Samaritan. It wasn't just a certain ethnic group. It was a despised Samaritan. Like throwing shade and everything, this despised Samaritan and this had absolute racial implications because Jews and Samaritans hated one another. Jews thought that they were preferred. Jews thought that, that they were of a higher class or caste because Samaritans were this combination of Jewish blood and Assyrian or Syrian blood. So they were a mixed race. And the Jews didn't care for that because they thought they were God's perfect people and because their pedigree didn't line up. They decided that they had the right to despise and hate Samaritans. And when you're hated by somebody, guess what? You're going to give it right back. Sometimes you're, you're going to go, I'm not going to be a doormat. If you don't like me, I'm not going to like you either. And so Jesus intentionally picks a story that would have hit every ear that was listening. And it's not too far-fetched to say that Jesus was actually condemning racism in this moment when you realize the audience that he had was all Jewish and he makes the hero of the story the very person and the very race that they despised. Jesus knew what he was doing right here. So I want you to see five things that, that we're pulling out of this text that I think represent a Samaritan spirit, and I think they represent grace itself. And the five things are this. First of all, the Samaritan saw him. The priest saw him and acted like he didn't. The Levite saw him and chose to walk away. I wonder what he was thinking as he stood over and saw the blood and saw the bruising and saw his naked body and yet could walk away. But the Samaritan saw different. And one of the things that we have to learn how to pray is, God, show me how to see people the way you see people. See, the thug saw him as a victim to be exploited. The priest saw him as a nuisance to be ignored. But the Samaritan saw him as someone made in God's image and in need of help. How do we see people? How do we view people? We've got to see with the eyes of a Samaritan. Number two, he, had, he didn't just see him. The Levite saw him but walked away. He saw him and had compassion. God stirred something in his heart. We need to be a people of compassion. 1 John 3, 17 says, If someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or a sister in need but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? 
Welcome to the American situation. Now, I'm not making light of the fact that 20%, 19 to 20% of Americans live under a poverty line. I'm not making light of that. But I have been to third world countries before. I have smelled the smell of people living out of garbage dumps before. And the truth is we are a blessed nation. And there's this challenge from John the Beloved. And he's saying, how can you have this good life? Uh, let me say it this way, this American dream. And you're so blessed, but you can't help anybody else. You can't live beyond yourself. This is a challenge. And if it feels uncomfortable, good. Because these are the inconvenient truths. God's been so good to us. And we come in, bless your name, Lord. But where are you helping? Where are you serving? Where are you emptying yourself? Everything this Samaritan did was inconvenient. And yet he was driven by his compassion. What was the last time you saw something that messed you up and broke your heart? Because if you can't remember, maybe it's time for you to do something. Maybe it's time for you to be shaken and get out of that comfort zone and that stupor state that you're in. So he sees and he has compassion. But not only did he see, it says he went to him. He turned his compassion into action. And that's what we need to do as the church. One of the reasons that we're so passionate about outreach. Yes, we do. We do incredible outreach in India. We actually, um, uh, babe, I don't even know if, if you know this. It's been a little busy. Don't be scared right now. Um, but you know, we, we have 114 pastors in India and there were some pastors who live in very rural places and there was an ask for the pastor's kids to get uniforms and clothes and, and, and uh, backpacks and those sorts of things. And so, yeah, it was, it was no big deal. We, 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 we literally, we cannot, we, in our bylaws, we cannot give less than 10% of what comes into the house out nationally, internationally, in our own community, to our neighbors. And so, yeah, we took care of this need. And all of a sudden, my WhatsApp is blowing up, and I'm seeing these precious kids. And, and they, like, they're so proud of like, their little suit and ties. And it's, it's like, it's like uh, suit shorts, you know, because it's hot in India. And, but that's what we're called to do. We're blessed for a purpose, and there should be a compassion that should well up into us, and it should take us to a place of action. Let me say something that is uncomfortable. You don't have to ha be angry to have action. One of the things that marked Martin Luther King Jr.'s movement was he did it through peace. He didn't have to get angry to do it. He could have peace in him and still be moved with compassion for something that was wrong and unjust. So we've got to let our compassion drive us to action. All right. Number four, he was equipped to minister. There's a, there's a scripture, I can't remember the address at the moment, but it talks about being instant in season and out of season. In other words, it's, it's saying always be ready to minister. Now, I know you might think, well, pastor, you're the minister. You have the title. Actually, if you want to get down to it, I'm actually the equipper of the saints, i.e. you guys. So you guys are actually the ministers. And if you're still waiting for a title, you just got one. Because Corinthians says that we are all ministers of reconciliation. So let's live up to our job description, which, by the way, is the Great Commission. Go out into all the world, into all your neighborhood, into all Newcastle, into all Bear, into all Middletown, into all Townsend. And be, bring and be the gospel. He was equipped to minister but I think there's a beautiful, metaphoric, symbolic picture here. What does he do? He takes wine 
and oil. Yes, I understand those were, those were things that you would use as a medicine in that time. But when you see wine and oil used in the Bible, it's typically symbolic of Holy Spirit. And the truth is, I believe it's a picture that we as New Testament believers, if we have Holy Spirit resident within us, we have something to give to hurting humanity. We have something that heals. He used what he had and he gave what he had. Sometimes we can think, well, I can't do anything because I don't have anything. Okay, let's demystify that for just a second. Remember Moses, God calls him and he's like, all the excuses in the world. You know, I, I can't do this because, you know, I, I can't do this because I don't, I, I'm not a good talker. I'm not eloquent of speech. I don't have anything. How am I going to confront Pharaoh? And God says, what's in your hand? And he's like, my stick. God said, that'll do. Throw it down, becomes a snake, grabs it by the tail, picks it back up. It becomes a stick again. God says, that's enough. How about the little boy with the, he's rocking some, uh, you know, filet fish from Mickey D's. And he's got, he's got a, a couple filets and some fries. And this is my version, not yours, okay? I understand what the scripture says. But he's got his filet of fish and Jesus says, that'll be enough. Because Jesus knew that if he blessed it, it would multiply. Because when God blesses something, it can't help but multiply. And so the point is, use what you've been given. Use what you had. The Samaritan didn't say, well, I can't do anything because I'm not a rich man or I don't have enough. He gave of what he had. And if God can entrust you with what you have, he can bring about the opportunity and then he can give you more because if he can trust you to do what's right with what you have and the opportunity that came your way, guess what? He the, those who can be faithful with little, God said, I'll make you ruler over much. If you can be faithful with a little, I'll put more on your plate because I can trust you with it. Yes. Number five, he took him to where he could be restored. Well, what does that look like? Sometimes you're just going to have to pick somebody up and take them to church. Sometimes you're just going to Mm, you're going to have to take them to rehab kicking and screaming because you know what's best for them. Or you might have to take them to a Christian counselor. Well, my pride can't handle that. What will people say? Who cares what people say? You'll get healed. You'll get free. The chains are coming off. He took him to where he needed to be. I have a friend and, and he's from Norway and his parents used to uh, they, would, they would often witness to drug addicts and these drug addicts would give their life to Christ. But, but then if, if, if they didn't have a, a way to get clean, they would go right back to it. So they would actually take them out on the water for months while they rehabbed, while they detoxed, while they got clean and then preached the gospel to them. Talk about inconvenient but this picture is a picture of restoration. It's a picture of discipleship. And that's what they were doing. They were discipling. Not only that, we see that the Samaritan checks back on him. And he was willing to invest his own income. What are you willing to invest to see the kingdom grow? The truth is we shouldn't just sit in church for us. We should invite somebody. And then when they start coming... You need to start investing. You're like, I don't know enough scriptures. That's okay. You know John 3.16? Okay, you're good. Just walk it out with them. Live it out with them. Find somebody and be Jesus to them. Not only does this story paint a picture of grace, which was Jesus' message. It was his essence. It was his ministry. It was his very persona. But it shows us how he did it. Didn't grace leave the 99 to go after the one? Doesn't it look like grace to forgive 70 times seven in one day and then do it all over again tomorrow? Pastor, you're wearing me out. You're wearing me. You know what grace looks like? Grace looks like the woman who's caught in the act. 
and Jesus stops the mob in their tracks. That's what grace looks like. And this Samaritan is demonstrating a picture of grace. And I truly believe that the good Samaritan is actually a type of Christ. Jesus is telling a story and some people think that the story is fiction and Jesus was just using it as a parable. Others think that the story was a real story that happened. And when you think about the detail of Jerusalem to Jericho, it really could have been. But I think there's an even deeper meaning. I think this is a type of Christ. Jesus is actually painting a picture of himself as he's talking about this Samaritan. And it says he was moved with compassion when he saw the man beaten and left dead on the road. Wasn't it Jesus who cried when he looked over Jerusalem and wept over Jerusalem? Jesus was moved with compassion. And so this Samaritan personally paid for, he personally sacrificed his own livelihood to get this man healed and restored. Wait a second. Didn't Jesus give of his own life and his own livelihood to see us, humanity, be healed and restored? This is a picture of what Jesus did for us. Jesus was moved with compassion when he saw hurting humanity and when he saw what the devil had done to us, beat us up and left us for dead. So he sacrificed. And what I want to do is I want to end with just three questions. Remember, we're talking about inconvenient truths. The first one is this, who is your neighbor? The point is this, all of humanity is your neighbor. That's what Jesus is trying to bring home. Jesus was able to take Samaritans and Jews who didn't like each other, use this story and he made enemies friends. He made neighbors out of enemies. And I want to say this, it was, it was put on my heart to say this, and I'm just going to touch it and move on. But I can't talk about challenge and I can't talk about truth if we can't talk about real things. And because we see church in the, in the construct of family, can I say this? I realize I'm not dumb. I've got a news app on my phone. Um, this is an election year. And, and let's not use what's happening in the world seep into the kingdom of God. Because oftentimes what we'll do is we'll take differences to ostracize, villainize, marginalize, and weaponize because of our differences. Let's make sure we keep in mind the story of the Good Samaritan, knowing that all of humanity is our neighbor. And not only is all of humanity our neighbor, and we're supposed to love our neighbors and do good to our neighbors, but the Bible says, especially to the household of faith. Your brothers and sisters down the row, we should do especially good to them. So as the world is dividing, let's be a church that's uniting. Let's remember our brothers and sisters, the household of faith. Let's remember those who are in India. We have pastors going through persecution. I've heard of incredible persecution that's going on in Nicaragua right now. Let's remember. Number two, what character are we going to play? Are we going to be the religious person who turns the blind eye? Or are we going to be the Samaritan willing to do good to anyone hurting or in need of healing? Question number three. What does a neighbor do? Answer, whatever it takes. This Samaritan absolutely inconvenienced himself. And discipleship isn't convenient. It's costly. But it's eternal and it's worth it. And Jesus gives this punchline. He says, show mercy. Mercy is kindness and goodwill. 
It literally means kindness and goodwill. In other words, the Bible says freely you've given or freely you've received, now freely you should give. If you've received, there's a responsibility to give out and to pour out and to give away. In Australia, outside of Sydney, uh, there's, there's a, a cliff and it's called the Gap at Watson's Bay. And it's a popular tourist attraction because it's got this 184 foot drop down into the sea. So not only is it popular as a tourist attraction, it has also become a place that's popular for people to go and commit suicide. And there was a man named Don Ritchie. He recently passed away, but he was a World War II veteran. And he lives near the Gap at Watson's Bay. And he was actually nicknamed the Angel in the Gap because for over five decades, it's estimated that he talked 160 people out of committing suicide. And when he was interviewed, he said this, he said, never be afraid to speak to those who you feel are in need. Always remember the power of a simple smile, a helping hand, a listening ear, and a kind word. What's mercy again? It's kindness, a kind word. You don't have to have a superpower to make a difference. You don't have to be rich to make a difference. Do you got a smile? Do you got some kindness? Do you got Holy Spirit in you? Are you a child of God? <laughs> the title of our message was like a good neighbor. You're there. You're there. You're there. You be the good neighbor. Middletown, we love you so much. But as we conclude, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to the team. Thank you for being with us. But in here, I don't want to miss an opportunity to pray and to pray with you. So I want us to bow our heads, close our eyes. And I want us to enter into just a holy moment of prayer right now. And I never want to have somebody come into God's house and not have an opportunity to meet God and to meet his family. So if you're in here this morning and you don't know Jesus, the, the, the Bible's really clear. People talk about getting to heaven by the good things we do. I'm not saying do bad things, but I'm saying the Bible is clear that there is only one way to heaven and the door is named Jesus. So you can know all kinds of church, religion, you can memorize scriptures, you can quote stuff, but if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, that is the only way for eternal life. So I need to make an introduction to some today. So I want everybody in here to pray with me, not some kind of religious mantra or traditional prayer, but I want you to pray from heart. I want you to pray from authenticity. And I want everybody in here to repeat after me. Just say, Jesus, would you save me? I can't save myself. I need your help. I need your healing. I need your hope. Come free me right now. Jesus, I believe that you died for me. I believe that you can erase my sin. And I believe I can live for you for all eternity. Save me, God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. With heads still bowed, with eyes still closed, this is for someone or someones. It's not for everybody. But if you're in this room this morning and that was an authentic prayer, and you prayed that for relationship with Jesus. Right now, would you just raise your hand so I can see who I was praying for? Is there anybody this morning? Just throw your hand up. Okay, I see that hand. That hand over there. Is there anybody else? Balcony. And you, oh, I see one in the balcony. Awesome. I see one in the back corner. Praise God. See your hand, sir. All right, we can look up. Can we just thank the Lord that his family just grew? 
Now, for those of you who raised your hand, who prayed that prayer in the best faith you know how, the only thing I'm gonna ask you is there's a card in the seat in front of you. Would you just take another moment, put your name, phone number down, and just say, I prayed the prayer. Just write it on there. Doesn't have to, you don't have to have great penmanship. Just write it on there. You can drop it off in the boxes on the way out. That gives me and the staff the ability to know who you are so that we can continue praying for you. Can we give one, God one more hand clap this morning?